I mentioned to you that one of the things we're going to do to open up each session is to introduce you to somebody uh, who heads up a ministry at St. Peter's. They may be staff people. They may be non-staff people. Uh, tonight uh, with us is our school principal, Paul Meredith. Uh, Paul uh, has, is this your third year, Paul? It's his third year, and we're thrilled to have Paul. Uh, you can uh, see by his tennis shoes. I thought they were Olympic hand-me-down tennis shoes, but he was, uh, Texas is home for him. And so uh, he says those are Texas shoes and not USA Olympic shoes. So, Paul, if you'd come, uh, Phyllis, talk to us about uh, the ministry of the school, and, and uh, there may be some here who have kids or grandkids who might be interested as well. Howdy. There we go. Yeah, so these shoes were marketed to me as Texas flag shoes, so I was a sucker for them and said, those are mine. So um, I'm originally from Texas. This is my third year here at St. Peter's Lutheran School. Happy to serve as principal uh, here at St. Peter's. Um, good to see we've got a couple of teachers in the crowd as well. Um, so for those of you that don't know, St. Peter's Lutheran School, we serve students from kindergarten all the way to eighth grade. Uh, we have approximately 410 students on our campus. Uh, we have about 29 teachers. Uh, and then with our support staff, including cafeteria, our aides, uh, school nurse, we have about 45 total staff members uh, that support St. Peter's Lutheran School. So we are uh, a school that's been in existence for quite a while. I believe this is 159th year um, that we have um, been a school here in Columbus, Indiana. So uh, we've served Columbus for a long, long time. Um, one of the unique things about Indiana is that we are a choice state, choice school state. Uh, so over the past 10, 15 years, the state of Indiana, um, what they do is they allow families uh, to choose between public and private school. And depending on your income level, uh, the money that normally would be sent to a public school gets sent to the private school uh, of your choice. So we have our demographics uh, of St. Peter's, I would say over the last 10, 15, 20 years or so, uh, has shifted dramatically. We've increased the number of students that, that we serve here at St. Peter's. Um, and really the, the education, you know, a lot of families when they think about private school, um, they think, oh, I don't know if I can necessarily afford it. But the state of Indiana, the government, uh, has done a really nice job at allowing more and more access to families uh, to private schools over the last several years. Uh, one uh, critical thing I think that we've added over the last, uh, or this year, is we have a, a special education director here at St. Peter's, which is really going to, I believe, help open up and diversify our student population even more uh, as we move forward. So we're super excited to have a brand new special education director on board this year to, um, you know, hopefully uh, expand who we can reach. And when, we, when I meet with new families, you know, the things I talk about uh, consistently is, you know, we are blessed to live in a community that has a school corporation like BCSC that's, I believe, really good. You know, there are some things that BCSC can do that we can't, but there are some things that we can do that BCSC can't do. You know, we can offer smaller class sizes to families, uh, but the one thing that I tell families, new families looking at St. Peter's for the first time is that we intentionally teach about Jesus on a daily basis. And you're not going to get that at BCSC. You know, I believe our academics are just as strong as BCSC, if not stronger. Um, but our teachers daily um, teach about uh, Jesus. And that really separates us from our local public schools. Uh, and we're super excited about that. So our school, just like any other school, you know, our kids have reading, writing, math, science, social studies. They go to art class. They go to music class. Uh, they have got dedicated discipleship time every day. Uh, we go to, we worship together as a school in, in chapel weekly every Wednesday morning at 8, 10 a.m. in the sanctuary. Um, that's my favorite part of the week is when our entire student body and staff come together in the sanctuary and we're able to worship together. Uh, it's just, it's fantastic to see our kindergartners um, all the way up to our eighth graders in the sanctuary together worshiping. Uh, some, some areas where, we, where I'm always looking for people to jump in if you're looking to get involved in the school. Uh, we have a program called Book Buddies, um, and that's where we have volunteers from uh, the church come in, and they work with younger kids that are learning to read 
uh, just give them some extra time, another mentor or two uh, as they work through their reading skills. Um, that's a, a really great program. It's benefited many, many of our students um, over the last couple of years. We are always looking for substitute teachers. So if you are, are interested in getting plugged into the school, um, you know, please reach out to myself. My contact information is on the website. Um, or you can reach our school uh, administrative assistant, Paula Kamen. Her contact information is on uh, the website as well. Um, if you do have kids and you're interested or grandkids uh, interested in the school, um, I would be happy to uh, meet with any one of you, um, give you a school tour, go into more depth about our curriculum and, and kind of what we do, how do we, how we uh, raise our kids up in the school. Uh, and I'll leave you with this. You know, there, there are three things that I think we really do well at St. Peter's uh, with our students. You know, we're trying to raise our students to become the best they can academically, socially, and really trying to develop them spiritually on a daily basis. Uh, and that's what our, our staff, uh, when we talk to our staff every year, we're like, make sure that they're growing academically, socially, but most importantly, that their spiritual lives are being developed on a daily basis. So... Are we doing questions or is that it? Uh, do you have any questions? You can if you want. Do you have any other questions for Paul? Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Your prayers would be appreciated as we navigate another year of COVID in school. So um, I'm sure some of you may have reached out to me already, but um, I just thank you for the, if you haven't, thank you for the support and the, and the prayers as we uh, try to navigate another school year uh, with COVID. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. And we do have a, we have a great partnership with BCSC, and I really appreciate their willingness to work with us in so many ways. Uh, for example, in sports, if we do not host a sport, then uh, our kids can participate with BCSC. So, for example, we have cross country at St. Peter's in the fall. Um, we have uh, girls volleyball in the fall, uh, but we don't have football. We don't have a large enough population to have a football team. So if our kids want to play football, they play it at uh, Central Middle School. Uh, our, we don't have wrestling, uh, but it, we, our kids can wrestle at Central Middle School, and we've had a great partnership with that, and we've really enjoyed that. Uh, our kids ride the, the BCSC buses, and uh, it's just we really are, are grateful to have a, a good partnership. And we have a great public school system, I believe, in our, in our community, and so uh, we are not uh, in competition in that sense. We just appreciate the partnership we've been able to enjoy. If you did not, um, there should be on your table, except for on the two over the tables over there. So if you guys have all put your name on that white sheet in the middle, if not, would you do that? And if you have, would you pass it over there, give that, and we'll make sure that you guys have a chance to put your names on that as well. So again, we're here because in this room because it gives us a little more space to spread out, and I'm grateful that you are here, so thank you for making the effort to do that. Just a reminder, there is a meal every Wednesday night served in the cafeteria right over here. Uh, they start serving at 5.30. They stop serving 6.15 or 6.20. But if you're rushed and it's difficult for you to, to uh, stop and get something to eat before you come, just come here. And uh, tonight they had grilled cheese and uh, salad and uh, chicken soup. So, and something for dessert. I can't remember. I didn't get there, so I don't know. But I'm glad that you are, uh, you're here with us. One of the other things that we are, uh, I mentioned as we're gonna, we begin each week is we'll have somebody to speak about some aspect of ministry at St. Peter's. And then I want to show you a, uh, another little video clip. Those of you who were with us last week saw that one. Uh, for our 150th anniversary a few years ago, we put together 52, one for each week, 90 second video vignettes telling the story of St. Peter's. And some people who are fifth or sixth generation St. Peter's people know a lot of those stories. But most of us aren't fifth or sixth generation. Uh, including me. Uh, I'm a first-generation St. Peter's person. So let's take a look at, um, uh, let's see, oh, we'll start over again. And Due to sometimes dangerous and long trips to reach the church, it was necessary to find a location. 
Church of Apostolic Air Ministry, Pastor George Sekulow. By the early 1870s, St. Peter was firmly rooted in Christ. Okay. So when you think about that, uh, before the Civil War started, before the Civil War started, St. Peter's Lutheran Church was founded. Before Abraham Lincoln was president, uh, St. Peter's Lutheran Church uh, was founded. Always on this property. Um, uh, in fact, uh, only about when he talked about the first sanctuary, uh, it was about 75 feet this direction uh, on 5th Street. So we've always been in this area. So let me get here. I have to switch from the one to the other. Oops. So last week, if you uh, were not with us, or just a brief review, uh, we said that this is a Bible investigation class. And the purpose of this class, this is not a historical study of all the religions of all the world from the beginning of time. Uh, this is a study of what we call the Bible, uh, from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, we don't have the time to go ch verse, chapter by chapter and verse by verse through every book of the Bible, but we will, <clears throat> for the, today, <coughs> uh, we'll make our way through the rest of the table of contents to see how all this fits together. Because I just want you to know, as I said last week, the Bible is not, um, it's not a, a, a bunch of uh, myths. It's not a bunch of, you know, who said what and, and all these kind of things. The Bible was written over a period of 1,600 years from around 1,500 B.C. to about 100 A.D. with about 40 different authors who wrote them. Most of the authors didn't know one another, but it all fits. And so we just talked about uh, some of those things last week, and then we began to, to dive into the table of contents just a little bit. And so I want us to continue that uh, today. Uh, we also talked about how uh, the, the Bible lands, and you see them here. And so this is really where, when you read in the Scriptures, this is the land where all that took place. So uh, the Garden of Eden, I believe, was right around in this area because here's the Euphrates River, here's the Tigris River. And when the, we read in the, Garden of, in the book of Genesis about the Garden of Eden, it was bordered on the Tigris and the Euphrates and two other rivers that we don't, uh, we don't know where they are now. We can't find those rivers. And then Abraham, and around, the year two, around the year 2000 B.C., and his wife Sarah came up in this direction, and they made their way down south into this land that was then called the land of Canaan. And in that land of Canaan, Abraham had a son named Isaac, and Isaac had a son named Jacob, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel. And Jacob then had uh, uh, 11 or 12 sons, and they began to have children, and uh, they became a pretty big family. And so the, when we talk about the nation of Israel or the Jews, or the Hebrews. It's a term that we can use interchangeably when we talk about them. It was a family. That's what it was. It was a big family. And, and they had uh, 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 different... Uh, they had their kids. Let's see. Here we go. Um, and then they ultimately, uh, they ultimately settled in this land. Uh, here's the Mediterranean Sea. Africa is right down here. Egypt is right over here. Um, Iraq is over... Uh, in this area, Turkey is up in this area. Uh, Europe is over here. They settled in this land, and you can see the different names here. Simeon and Reuben and Judah and Benjamin and Dan and Gad. Those were all the sons of Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel. So when they crossed over the Jordan River, Moses led them out of Egypt. Uh, and we talked about that last week when we were, we were going through the table of contents. Moses led them out of Egypt, where they had been enslaved. And then Moses led them uh, up almost across the Jordan River, but Moses died uh, uh, on this. Moses died right about here where Mount Nebo is. And then Joshua led them across the river. And the town of Jericho, though it's not shown here, is about right here. And we read about, or we hear about how the walls of Jericho came tumbling down. Uh, all of this is, these are real people with real lives and real stories. This is not make-believe. We're not talking about the Greek gods and goddesses here. This is not mythology. Um, this is historical, real stuff as God worked in the lives um, of people. So uh, if you will, open in your uh, workbook to the table of contents. That's where we are. 
And so last time we talked about the first five books of the Bible, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. On the left-hand side of that margin uh, where the little bracket is, I ask you to write the word Moses because Moses is the author of those first five books of the Bible. Uh, they're all, those first five books are also called the Torah, T-O-R-A-H. Uh, some refer to it as the Pentateuch, penta meaning five, first five books. We said that the word Genesis means beginnings, and it's about the beginning of creation, the beginning of the human race. Uh, a lot of good stories in the book of Genesis that we're familiar with, creation, Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel, Noah and the flood, Joseph and the coat of many colors, all that in Genesis. And then the word Exodus means to go out, and we, that's when we talked about how Moses had led the children of Israel uh, out of Egypt, out of slavery, across the Red Sea, down to Mount Sinai, where God gave them the Ten Commandments. And we'll spend a few weeks down the road talking about the Ten Commandments and what do they mean for us today. Um, we said the uh, Genesis Leviticus uh, was about the Levites, the uh, kind of the, the priests of the time, and Leviticus has a bunch of rules and laws and all that kind of stuff. And I said, if you're reading from, if you're going to read from Genesis to the end of the Bible, Genesis and Exodus, you're like in fifth gear, and you come to Leviticus, and it's like downshifting to second gear all at once, because all of a sudden it doesn't become quite as exciting. Uh, numbers, a lot of so and so begat so and so begat so and so begat so and so talking about the children of Israel and the 12 tribes, and it's a census, basically. And then Deuteronomy, we said, means second giving of the law. Deutero means second. Nomos means law. Deuteronomy means second giving of the law. So in Deuteronomy, we find the Ten Commandments given for the second time and a number of other things that we read earlier. That's where we left off last time. So tonight, as we continue, um, Joshua. So here's the map uh, that I talked about. And again, Moses died... Right about here in Mount Nebo, he could look over the Jordan River, and uh, I, I've had the privilege to travel to the Holy Land a few times, and one of those times we climbed up on Mount Nebo, and we stood there, and we looked uh, to the west across the Jordan River, and the Jordan River, by the way, is about the size of Hall Creek, okay? It's not like the Mississippi, it's not like the Ohio River, it's about the size of Hall Creek. Uh, sometimes in the rainy season, the water might be up to your chest, uh, but uh, much of the time, because they don't get a lot of rain there, it may be ankle deep, it may be knee deep, it may be dry on the bottom. But he led them across the Jordan River, and, and then they came to the city of Jericho, and Jericho was this mighty fortified city, and God gave them the city. If you read the book of Joshua, it says how they came and they were intimidated because uh, Jericho was this mighty city, it was an ancient city, and they get there and they think, God, you brought us here, now you're going to crush us under these, these, these big you know, bullies of this strong military uh, fo force. And so God said, no, I got it under control. So God said, on the first day, I want you to walk around the city. So they did. The second day, walk around. God, how come we're doing this? Just trust me, God says. On the third day, they walk around. So they do this for six days. And then on the seventh day, God says, I want you to walk around the city seven times. God, that's a long ways to walk. Just trust me, God said. So they walk around the city seven times, and after they've done that, we're told that the walls of the city came tumbling down, and God gave them the city, and all of a sudden, God was making his point. Listen, I got you. I, I got you. I'm going to take care of you. And some of us go through life, and life gets hard. Life's hard for all of us. I don't care who we are. I don't care where we grew up. I don't care where we work. I don't care our neighborhood where we live. Life is hard for all of us. Every single one of us have things in our life that are difficult and painful, things that at times cause us to lose sleep at night, things at times that cause us to worry, times where our hopes and our dreams are shattered. Life is hard for everybody, and it's all relative. You know, I mean, somebody's, somebody's pain over here may be excruciating for them, and somebody over here may think, well, that's not a big deal because I'm dealing with this, but life is hard for all of us. And when God led his people into that promised land, he was saying, hey, I got you. Uh, you see, as I said last week, to live in a relationship with God doesn't mean life's going to be smooth. To live in a relationship with God says, I've got a God who knows my needs, whose eyes are always focused upon me, who is aware of everything I'm dealing with, and he's got me in the very palm of his hand, and he is not going to let me go. So I don't ever want to give you the impression that a relationship with God is going to make life easy. 
Sometimes Jesus told the story, uh, a parable about a guy who was sowing some seed, and he sowed some seed in the soil, and, and some of the seed took root, and it brought forth fruit from the earth, and some of the seed fell on the rocky soil, and, and its roots couldn't go down very deep, and it died off. Some of the seed was on the soil, and the birds came and ate it up. And, 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 and sometimes what happens is that the, the devil, who I believe is very real, loves to do this. The devil loves to come to us when life is hard and say, where's your God now? Where's your God? If your God is so loving, if your God is so mighty, if your God is so caring, then why, does, why, why are you suffering in such a way? And there are some folks that say, you know what? You're absolutely right. Forget this God thing. Why do I need him? What good does it do? A relationship with God should not be entered into because we think we're all of a sudden going to have a multi-million dollar house and we're going to have a multi-million dollar salary and we're going to drive $75,000 automobiles and we're going to travel to exotic locations five times a year and our kids are going to be perfect and everything's going to be great. That's not, that's not the real world. You know, lifestyles of the rich and famous, a lot of it's make-believe. And every one of those rich and famous people have things that are painful and difficult for them as well. I can assure you of that. So God says to his people, I, I got you. I know you're scared. I know you're intimidated. I know you're frightened, but I've got you. I, I'm with you. And Joshua is about how God led the people into the land, and then he began to divide up the territory for them. Judges, the book of Judges, yeah, in the days of Joshua, so again, remember, Moses lived around 1500 B.C., sometime between 14 and 1500 B.C. And then, uh, and, and then uh, and Moses lived to be 120. And folks began to live less after that. Yeah, we have in Genesis a guy named Methuselah who lived like 600 and some years. And, and we have people who lived a long, long time. But the fact of the matter is um, th that people's lifespan began to shorten. You say, well, maybe a year wasn't the same. I think it was the same. I think it was the same. And in fact, when you came to the time of Jesus, if you lived to be 50, you were living a pretty long time. You lived to be a pretty long time. So, um, uh, so in, in Judges, that day, so, so Joshua lived around, let's say, 1400 B.C., 1350. And uh, in Joshua's time, Israel didn't have any kings. We're going to find a little bit later about some of the kings. The most well-known king of Israel was King David. Um, but they didn't have kings. The other nations had kings, but Israel didn't have kings because God was their leader. Uh, they had judges, though. And the judges were people, and they were different judges, and they would assist in legal affairs uh, in the land. They would help to settle disputes and do those kinds of things. And there were male judges, and there were female judges. There was a woman named Deborah who was one of the most well-known, one of the most effective uh, judges in the nation of Israel. God's not sexist. God's uh, God, God values female as well as he does male. There, there was a guy named uh, uh, Samson uh, who was one of the judges. Uh, Samson, who we know, the guy that had the long hair. And the, and the enemies were trying to figure out, how do we stop this guy? And they finally figured out, cut his strength was in his hair. Uh, there was a judge named Gideon. And uh, we hear about the Gideons. When I was in elementary school, uh, the Gideons are an organization that they, they place, among other things, they place Bibles like in schools or in hotels. If you stay in a hotel and open the drawer uh, in, the, in, the, in the hotel room, you may find a Bible that says Gideons on it. So Gideon was one of the judges. There were a number of judges. And so the book of Judges talks about those different judges and their lives and, and how God used them in all of that. Then the book of Ruth. Ruth is a little book. And Ruth is a tiny little book about a woman named Ruth and her mother-in-law named Naomi. And in the book of Ruth, Naomi is a woman who had two sons. And her sons were now adults, and her sons were each married, uh, but her sons died, and her husband. So Ruth has dealt with a lot of grief in a very short period of time. Her husband's died, she's a widow, her sons die, they're married, but they die without having any children. So, so Naomi is just heartbroken, and she says to her daughters-in-law, she said, listen, you're young, uh, you can still find another husband, you don't have to stay with me, you go wherever you want and, and find, uh, find another husband and get on with your life. And Ruth said to her, no, Naomi, uh, you and I were in this thing together. She said, in fact, 
uh, Naomi, wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you stay, I'll stay. And your people will be my people. Some people have used that for a, a, a wedding text, and it's okay, it, it fits that, but it really wasn't intended in a husband-wife relationship. It was, its original roots were found in a conversation between a daughter-in-law and her mother-in-law. And the daughter-in-law who said, listen, I can see life is hard for you, and I believe that God put me in your life for a reason, and so I'm going to be there with you through thick and thin. And Naomi, life became so difficult, her grief began to well up, and it just, it just wouldn't subside. And when her friends came to her, she got to the point Naomi did to say, don't even call me Naomi anymore, call me Mara. And the word Mara means bitter. She said, I'm just mad. I'm mad at God. I'm mad at the world. I'm mad at life. My husband has been taken away from me. My sons have been taken away from me. I am angry. And that's, that, that's grief. That's grief. So if you go through a difficult time in your life, when you go through a difficult time in life, uh, and, and you become angry as a part of that grief, that's to be expected. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It doesn't mean you're less of a Jesus follower. It doesn't mean that you don't have faith. It's part of grief. Somebody loses their job, uh, th there, there's grief. Somebody loses a, a loved one, there's grief. Somebody learns that something uh, horrible is happening in the life of a loved one, that's grief. And, and, and anger, anger, when they talk about grief, I know they're the five stages of grief and all that stuff, but with their anger can be turned outward or inward. So um, inward anger of grief is called guilt. So something bad happens, and we, we say, well, what did I do to bring this on? Or I should have done something differently. Somebody has a spouse or a loved one who is uh, in hospice care. They're at the hospice center here in town. And they're spending every hour, every conceivable hour, with that loved one in the room, in the hospice center. And then at a certain point, they have to use the bathroom. The, the family member does. So the, the loved one's still on the bed, and they go in and use the bathroom, and they come out of the bathroom, and the loved one stopped breathing. And they feel guilty because they were in the bathroom. But they're there like 23 hours a day around the clock. And we all would say, don't beat yourself up. I mean, you, you did a yeoman's task being there for your loved one. And so guilt, this anger towards self, even though usually it's not justifiable, it's just, it's, it's there. And it just takes a while for it to wear off. And there's nothing that you can say. I mean... Uh, I, I can say to somebody, if we have somebody, let's say they are struggling with a, an eating disorder, and let's say they, they, they weigh, you know, 75 pounds, when healthy they might weigh 110 pounds, and they, when they look in the mirror, they see themselves like this. And we know they're like this. But for me to say, oh, you're not, you're not fat, it, because in people, in our mind, how do we see ourselves? And the person who's struggling with grief, like Naomi was, like we all do at one time or another, part of grief is anger turned inward, which is guilt, and it just takes a while to work through it, uh, or anger turned outward. So the anger could be at the doctor, who we don't think of the medical team, we don't think they did everything they should have done to care for grandma. Or anger could be, if, it's, uh, uh, if, if grandma died, maybe anger is toward my sibling because I was working my tail off trying to take care of grandma, but my sibling over here was paying no attention to grandma, so I get angry with my sibling. Or maybe sometimes people get mad at the person who died. How dare you die on me? So sometimes God is the victim of anger. God, how dare you? How dare you? And God can handle that. That's okay. God can handle that. It's okay to get angry with God. When you read the book of Psalms, there are many Psalms, there's a fancy word called imprecatory. I, you don't need to know it, but I'm just, I'm, I'm showing off my, my brilliance here, uh, and you'll know that I don't have a lot of it. But an imprecatory Psalm is where the psalmist is so frustrated with life. And on more than one occasion, we read the scriptures where the psalmist will say, God, why is it that the, the righteous seem to suffer and the wicked seem to prosper. It's not fair. And maybe you've thought that. Why is that? 
Here I am trying to, you know, do my thing and be a good citizen and be a good person and be a good spouse and be a good child or be a good parent. And then look at what happens. God, why? And here's somebody over here who's a horrible husband and he's a horrible father. But look at look at all the money he's making or whatever it might be. These psalms that just cry out to God in anger. And so Naomi was really struggling. And so Ruth walked alongside of her. I think part of the point of the book of Ruth is that God says, when life is really, really hard, I am never going to leave you. I am never going to leave you. You may tell me to get lost. You may, you may look the other direction. You may not open up my word and listen to my voice. But the reality is, I am never going to leave you. And then God later proved his faithfulness to Naomi and to Ruth in a number of ways. But that's the book of Ruth. First and second Samuel, you can, around that, that, you can write the name David, King David, because much of first and second Samuel is about the life and the, the ministry and the kingship of King David. David was the youngest of several sons, and, um, and it was time to anoint a new king. The first, so Israel got its first king in the year, around the year 1050 B.C., so remember, Moses around 1500 B.C., um, and then uh, Joshua around 1400 B.C., and then, in the, and then they had those judges during that time after they entered the promised land. But what we find is then that in 1050 B.C., God uh, uh, anointed a king whose name was Saul, S-A-U-L. And Saul started off, and he was a big dog king. He was highly respected. People, he was a big guy, too. He was a big guy, and, uh, and he was a mighty warrior. And Saul finished very, very well, but he finished very poorly. I've sometimes used the, the language he suffered from the Pete Rose syndrome. You know, I, uh, baseball is a major part of my life. I played a lot of uh, baseball and uh, football in my life, and, but baseball was my, my favorite sport. And, and uh, Pete Rose, who I thought was an awesome player, he was playing when I was a little kid, and he was an amazing player. And frankly, I think he should be in the Hall of Fame. But Pete Rose, toward the end of his career, started betting on baseball games. Actually, it makes me really nervous when I see all these commercials now about betting on sports. I can guarantee you, if you're a baseball fan, what happened with the Chicago Black Sox scandal and Shoeless Joe Jackson will be happening again in, in major sports because the temptation will be so great because so many people have so much money on the line, it will happen. I wish they would never have legalized that because I've just seen so many people whose lives have been ruined uh, because they think that their gambling is going to bring them out ahead. Uh, the, the business people behind the, the riverboat gambling and the lottos and everything else are, they're doing it for a reason, because they know they're going to win. You're not going to come out on top. They will come out on top. But there's the thrill. There's the excitement. There's the, you know, what if? You know, what if I win $500 this day or whatever that might be? Um, but uh, so how in the world did I get onto that? I just lost my train of thought. Uh, David, David. Um, King David. So the Pete Rose syndrome. So Pete Rose, you know, he finished very well and he had a Hall of Fame career going until he got, he started betting on games and he got caught. And he didn't finish very well. And he should have been in the Hall of Fame by his statistics, but because he bet on the games, uh, he, he was ba banned from baseball. And just a sad story. King Saul started very well. And then when Saul was king, there was a, a group of people called the Philistines. And the Philistines lived uh, over here on the, uh, on the Mediterranean Sea. And the Philistines uh, had, a, had a, a, a warrior named Goliath. You've heard of David and Goliath. And Goliath was huge. Goliath, when you read uh, his size in the Bible, was larger than Shaq. Now, uh, before 9-11, you could go to an NBA game and you could walk down right around the court before the game started. And I remember before 9-11, my son David, who's now 35, but my son David and I, he was a little kid, we went to a Pacer game. And so we went all the way down, and when they were doing layups and warming up before the game, uh, I thought it'd be a thrill, well, it was for both of us, we just kind of walked around the court. And you could get, you know, from here to here to Shaq. This guy's huge. And, and you really have to stand up next to somebody like that to really appreciate, because not only is he tall, he was, he was a big man, he is a big man. But Goliath was larger than Shaq. So Goliath said one day, because the Philistines and the Israelites were like this. 
And so Saul said, or Goliath said, listen, we don't need all this bloodshed. Here's how we'll do it. You, Israel, you, King Saul, you take your mightiest warrior and put them on me one-on-one. Well, just the two of us will go at it. And if I win, you surrender to us. If you win, we'll surrender to you. How's that? Goliath was very confident uh, in his ability. And so uh, the word goes out among the Israelites, and nobody has the, the guts to say, we'll, we'll take him on. We'll take him on. But then this kid named David, uh, who was, I don't know, probably a teenager at the time, heard about this guy named Goliath who was trash-talking not only King Saul and trash-talking the nation of Israel, but trash-talking the God of Israel. And David loved God with all of his heart. And David said, listen, nobody trash-talks my God. I'll take him on. I'm sure people are laughing, you know, Goliath's like this, David's like this, David's probably a skinny little kid, Saul, uh, Goliath's this, this monster, gigantic kind of guy. And you know the story, he got his some stones and a slingshot, and, and here comes Goliath, and he's got his armor on, and I'm sure he sees David, and he's probably laughing, and David gets a slingshot and hits Goliath square in the head, and kills him and chops off his head, and, uh, and that began David's popularity. And then the, the, the women in the land began to sing a song, and their song said, Saul has slain his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. And Saul became extremely envious and extremely jealous. Uh, envy and jealousy can really eat away at us. And whether it's in the workplace, somebody else who's the golden child, and we want to be the star, or on an athletic team, and somebody else gets more press, more media, more attention than us, or somebody else makes a big play in the game, and maybe they make the game-winning shot, and they only scored three points the whole game, and we scored 20 points, but they scored the game-winning shot, and they get lifted up on their shoulders, and we're feeling sorry for ourselves over here because we didn't get lifted up on their... Envy can do some nasty, nasty things in people. In fact, in the book of Second Corinthians, or First Corinthians in the New Testament that Paul wrote, among his characteristics of love, he said, love does not envy. Love does not envy. So First and Second Samuel are about the life of, of King David, um, from his slaying of gi- the giant Goliath to when he was selected to be the successor to Goliath. And, uh, and when he was selected, Goliath was, I mean, Goliath, the successor to Saul, when he was selected, Saul was still the king. And David had no, he was like the, David was like the king elect, you know, the, the president elect. He wasn't king yet, and he wasn't trying to kick uh, Saul, uh, uh, Saul off the throne. He was respectful of Saul. But Saul was very jealous, very envious, because the women were singing, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. And Saul, on a number of occasions, tried to hunt David down and have him killed. And he didn't succeed. And David was in a position where he could have killed Saul. He literally could have killed him and gotten away with it, and nobody would have known it. But it's, all in the, it's all in the Bible. I'm not going to take all the time to go through all of it. But David spared his life. But David was also a man who, while he loved God with all of his heart, he was also a man who was human and susceptible to temptation like all of us are. There was the account, maybe you've heard the story of David and Bathsheba. David was the king now. Saul had died, and David was the king, and his men were off fighting in a battle, in a military battle. And David was back at home while the the army was out there fighting, and David was up on his roof. You say, why was he up on his roof? Well, in the Middle East, in Israel even today, uh, the roof is a place of socialization. The roofs aren't pitched like they are where we live. The roofs are flat. And they'd have tar and pitch on the, on the roof, and they would have, you'd have your Weber grill up on the roof. You'd have your lawn chairs up on the roof. You'd have your picnic table on the roof. You'd have your hammock up on the roof. So the roof was a place of socialization. And so David was up on the roof one day, and he's looking out, and he sees a couple of houses down a woman who was also bathing on the roof. Her name was Bathsheba. And David, being a guy sees her, and, and he's drawn to her. And Bathsheba's husband is off at war fighting in David's army, and David is attracted to her, even though David has a wife of his own. And David sends word to his men, I want you to bring that woman to me. And he had inappropriate relationships with her. She conceived a child as a result of that. 
David, when he learned she was pregnant, uh, called her husband back from battle right away so that he might come back and sleep with his wife so that he would think he was the father. And, and her husband, a guy named Uriah, if you're around my age, there was a group called Uriah's Heap, like in the 19, what, 70s or something like that. I, didn't, I don't know if I had any of their albums, but a group called, I don't had anything to do with Uriah in the Bible. But Uriah said, no, I can't come back because my, all my, my comrades here, they're fighting, they're, they're dying, they're, lis- you know, they're risking you know, their, their lives out here. I can't go home and be with my wife. So David knows now he's going to get caught, so what does he do? He has Uriah, uh, he tells his military leaders, put Uriah up on the front lines. Why? So Uriah will die and not come back and find that his wife has gotten pregnant by somebody else. And at first David just didn't catch on. Sometimes power and position can make one rather arrogant and cocky and think they are above the rules. That can happen. It can happen in politics, it can happen in the church, it can happen in, you know, in entertainment. Sometimes you, you, you reach a certain level and you think that you are above everything else. You think that the rules don't apply to you. And that's exactly what happened with David. Until a guy named Nathan came to him one day and painted a picture for him, and David finally came to realize the, the, the wrong that he had done. And he sought God's forgiveness as a result of that. So David was a much beloved king. Of all the kings of Israel, David is the most beloved. Uh, What do we call the star on the Israel flag? The star of David. Uh, David is greatly uh, uh, held very highly. First and second um, kings. Uh, First and second kings. So this is the land over which David uh, ruled. And then we go to um, this map. So you can see here Judah and Israel up here, okay? So uh, Bethlehem is here, Jerusalem, five miles, six miles north here, uh, the Sea of Galilee where Jesus uh, walked on the water up here. But Jesus came about a thousand years after King David. So after David, First and Second Kings is about the kings of Israel and Judah. That's what First and Second Kings is all about, about the kings who ruled over those lands. And some of them were good kings and some of them were rotten kings. Most of them were rotten kings. You might think, well, these were kings in biblical days. They should have been godly men. No, most of them were not. Most of them were not. And so so the first king was Saul in 1050 B.C. He ruled about 40 years. And then David was king. He ruled about 40 years. And then after David came his son Solomon. And we hear about the wisdom of Solomon. Well, Solomon was wise in some ways, and he was foolish in other ways. When Solomon became, when David was king, when dad was king, there was a lot of military conflict. But when David was done, he handed his son a peaceful empire. So Solomon had all this wealth. And Solomon didn't have to pay all the soldiers. And I mean, war is expensive. And now when Solomon becomes king, he's got all this, this treasury here that he can spend on other things instead of war. And Solomon, um, his father's advisors, and, and the Bible talks about, you know, to have advisors around us is, is wise, assuming they give us wise insight. Nobody knows it all. No leader knows it all. The, the president, regardless of who the president is, has their cabinet, people to advise them on on certain things. Any, any leader, uh, a- any pastor would be a fool to think that he knows more than all the other people in his congregation. He is, he is wise to say there are other people in this place who have insights that I don't have and who have something to contribute to the conversation. Likewise in the workplace. Likewise, you know, isn't it interesting if you watch an NBA game, oftentimes you'll find the assistant coaches in the huddle at a timeout while the head coach isn't even talking to them. You know, a a wise leader understands that he or she doesn't know everything, and a wise leader will pay attention to what other people are saying. Well, Solomon came in as king, and so he's going to clean house. I don't want any of these advisors my dad had. I'm going to pick my own, and he was going to pick all yes men. By the way, that's a dangerous thing, too. You know, if, if the only people you pick to advise you are people who think that you're, you know, the best thing in the world and that they're afraid to ever confront you, or afraid to ever challenge you, or they're only going to tell you what you want to hear, then forget about it. Why waste your time? That's what Solomon wanted. So what happened was, is that civil war broke out in Solomon's time. And so what was at once 
the United Kingdom of, uh, of Israel that we saw here, all of, this was all Israel, uh, became the divided kingdom with Judah in the south and Israel in the north. So we talk about the northern kingdom, we're talking about what's in the green. We're talking about the southern kingdom, we're talking about what's in the purple or whatever that color is, okay? So the northern section uh, retained the name of Israel, and the southern section took on the name of Judah. And Judah was one of the twelve sons of, uh, of Jacob, also whose name was changed to Israel, okay? So first and second kings are about uh, the kings who ruled um, over that land. And then first and second chronicles... First and Second Chronicles is a summary of everything we read about in the Old Testament. If you, if you have a Jewish uh, Bible, uh, a Tanakh, they would refer to it as. The Old Testament, we would refer to it as. So if you have, uh, if you have a Bible that, uh, in, in Jesus' day, the Bible that Jesus would have read, First and Second Chronicles were the last two books of the Bible. And it doesn't matter that there's a different order. It's still the same thing. But it makes sense. Because when you read about things in First and Second Chronicles, you will read about things that you read about in the book of Ezra or Nehemiah or Esther that actually come after in the order in which we have them. I don't know why they moved it there. It doesn't make any difference. It doesn't mean it's any less the Word of God. I'm just telling you that those two books were at the very end of the Jewish Bible. By the way, the Bible that Jesus had had no New Testament, right? I mean, the New Testament that we know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, so forth, was written after Jesus had already ascended into heaven. So the Bible Jesus had are these books that we call the Old Testament. That's the Bible of Jesus. And the teachings of Jesus are based primarily on those books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You don't need to know that to get into heaven, but it might serve you in, in some purpose along the way. So first, second Chronicles, so San Francisco, the newspaper in San Francisco, uh, one of them is called the San Francisco Chronicle, I believe. And it's an account, it's a summary, it's a, it's a report. And the first, so first and second Chronicles is a chronicling of uh, all, all the history of the scriptures. So uh, that's, what, that's what's there. Then... Uh, the bracket around Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, right there around the, uh, to the left of that bracket, the rebuilding of Jerusalem. The rebuilding of Jerusalem. So, here's Jerusalem right here. David, King David, around 1000 B.C., made Jerusalem the capital. So Jerusalem was the spot. And, and uh, his son Solomon built the temple, which was the, the, the center point, the focal point of Jewish worship in Jerusalem. So Jerusalem was the holy city. In fact, many say, would say that Jerusalem today would be considered the holiest city of any other place on the face of the earth. Why? Because in Jerusalem is where the temple was built. In Jerusalem is where Jesus uh, was crucified and rose from the dead. And in Jerusalem is where the Muslims believe that Muhammad uh, ascended into the heavens. And so when you look on TV, if you see images of people at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem or the Western Wall in Jerusalem, around, uh, around the city of Jerusalem were walls. And these walls were to protect them from, uh, from people who wanted to do them harm. And... and in the city of Jerusalem, there's what's called the Temple Mount. The Temple Mount is a, was a mountain that was leveled off. At the same mountain where Abraham took his son Isaac, when God told him to take his son Isaac up on top of the mountain to offer him as a sacrifice. Now, God pulled him back and said, don't do it. But, Ab but, but uh, that Mount Moriah is where the temple was built by King Solomon. And the Temple Mount was a huge area. The Temple Mount uh, was rectangular in shape. Uh, it ran north and south, and so it was about six football fields north and south. So that's a long way. Six football fields is a long way, and three football fields east and west. That's a lot of ground to cover. And then there was a wall all the way around that Temple Mount. And on that Temple Mount, on the western, let's see, over here, that's north. On the western side of the Temple Mount, uh, 
was, no, let me get my direction straight. On the eastern side of the Temple Mount uh, was, uh, no, it was on the western side, the temple. So if you see Jews at the Wailing Wall, they are up against that wall down below that was closest to the temple. So for them, that's the holiest place in the world because the presence of God dwelt in that temple. So when you see Jews on TV doing their thing and, and bowing uh, and rocking and praying, um, that's at the place where uh, they was right next to the temple. And then the Muslims believe so that the temple was destroyed um, a couple of different times, and they believe that Muhammad, their prophet, now Muhammad was not a nice guy. Okay, don't put Muhammad and Jesus like this. Muhammad was not a nice guy. Muhammad did a lot of not, uh, not so nice things to a lot of people. But they believe that Muhammad was ascended up into the heavens, and they believe that Muhammad ascended there, pretty much the same location where the temple was. And then where Jesus rose from the dead at the tomb was only probably 100 yards from, from the Temple Mount. So very special place for a lot of different uh, religions. So uh, what we find is that in the year, let's see, I'll show you another map. So uh, Jerusalem, right here. So David was king in 1000 B.C., Solomon in 950 B.C., um, and then we find that in the year 722 B.C., 722 B.C., the Assyrians came from the north. This is kind of the land where Turkey is up in this area. They came down and attacked uh, this area because they wanted world domination. Now, people were the same then as they are now. They want to rule the world. You know, we talk about how the British Empire began to spread and attack. The sun never sets on the British Empire. Why? Because they wanted to control. They wanted, they wanted to be in charge. Um, if you saw the movie Three, uh, 300, uh, the same thing when the Persians came from over here, when they were pushing up against Greece, they wanted, to, they wanted to expand their territory. Well, in the year 722 B.C., the Assyrians came down, and they took a number of Jewish folks back up in here to Assyria. And they ruled the world from 722 B.C. until 586 B.C. And in 586 B.C., uh, then we find that the Babylonians, so up here, this was the green part, this is where Assyria was, the Babylonians came uh, from this area, and they began to attack, and then the Babylonians conquered all this part of the world. So now the Israelites, the Jews, the Hebrews, are no longer independent people. They're no longer paying taxes for their own good. Now they, are paying, they were paying taxes and having to bow down to the Assyrians from 722 B.C. until 586 B.C., and now they're having to pay taxes to the Babylonians. When the Babylonians come, they crush Jerusalem. They crush it. They destroy the temple that Solomon had built. They knock down the walls around the city. Um, they, t they murder many of their people, and they take some of their people back with them. So what they do is they go into Jerusalem and Israel, and they find the, the, the best-looking, the most athletic, the most intelligent, the people who can help them, and they take them back here, and they make them go to work for them. So when you read in the Bible the story of a guy named Daniel, Daniel and the lion's den, Daniel was one of those people who lived here who was taken back here to Babylon. When you read the story about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three guys that were thrown into the fiery furnace, they were also people who lived over here who were taken back to Babylon. And, and, and it was not, life was not good. Nebuchadnezzar, who was the Babylonian king, was not nice. And he saw himself as a deity. Well, about 70 years after that then, the Persians, and I don't know if I have a, a map for that. Let's, let's see what the next... Uh, we'll go back to this one. The Persians were, were right over here. Persian Gulf, okay, Iraq, right up in here. Uh, Garden of Eden, somewhere in here. The Persians came, led by King Xerxes, and the Persians then came, and they crushed the Babylonians. So about 500 B.C. now, the Persians are in control. And after a while, the Greeks came from over here, and they conquered. And then after the Greeks came the Romans. So in the time of Jesus, the Romans were ruling the world. For, so from 722 B.C. until the birth of Jesus and beyond, the Israelites, the Jews, 
were subservient to some other country who would come to crush them and rub it in their face. So in Jesus' day, the Romans ruled the world. Caesar was in charge. And Caesar had his guys in different parts of the world who ruled. And they paid their taxes to Caesar. And, and we'll pick that up when we talk about the life and the ministry of Jesus. So in the book of Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther, in the book of Ezra, Ezra was a guy who felt compelled that when the Persians conquered the Babylonians, he felt compelled that he was to lead some of the people back to Jerusalem to rebuild the city, uh, the temple. So the book of Ezra is about Ezra going to King Xerxes, the king of Persia, and saying, King, you're king, I'm not, but how would you feel? Would it be possible for me to take some of my fellow Jews and go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple because it's a really special place for us, the temple that the Babylonians destroyed? By the way, if you watch the Indiana Jones movies, uh, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark or different Indiana Jones movies, and they're looking for the Ark of the Covenant, if you, if you've seen that movie, the Ark of the Covenant, God gave instructions back when the children of Israel were on the uh, Mount Sinai down here, okay, down in this area. And the Ark of the Covenant was not Ark like Noah's Ark. It was a box. It was about three feet long, two feet wide, two feet deep. It was made of wood. It was covered with gold. And on the inside, they had the two stone tablets on which God gave them the Ten Commandments and some manna with which God fed them when they were on their wilderness journey up to the promised land, and the walking stick that Moses' brother Aaron used. And so when the temple of Jerusalem was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 B.C., the Ark of the Covenant went missing. And that was a huge, because the presence of God, we're going to unpack that greatly when we talk about Jesus and the Lord's Supper. But the Ark of the Covenant was where the presence of God dwelt. If you saw the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark, do you remember what happened when they tried to open the lid of the Ark of the Covenant? They got zapped. They were goners. Why is that? Because sinful people cannot live in the presence of a holy God. Some people take sin very lightly. <laughs> Sinful people can't live. That's why we need a Savior. That's why we need someone to wash away our sin. And we'll unpack that as we move forward. But the fact is that the Ark of the Covenant was lost at the time that the Babylonians came and attacked there. And so, so Ezra goes to King Xerxes of the Persians and says, King, can I have permission to take some of my people back? And so they did. I think, I want to say around 50,000, I may be off on the number, but around 50,000 Jews then left and came back to Jerusalem, and under the leadership of Ezra, they rebuilt the temple. The book of Nehemiah, the next book, is about a guy named Nehemiah who says to the king, King, I feel led to go back and rebuild the walls around the city. And since this is your city, since, since Jerusalem falls under your jurisdiction, would it be possible for us uh, to go back and rebuild the walls around the city so that the city that you rule over would have a greater sense of fortification. So he said, okay. So the book of Nehemiah is about how they, another group of people returned to rebuild the walls around the city. And then the book of Esther. Esther was also a Jewish woman. And, and King Xerxes, um, if you didn't toe the line as the king's wife, as the queen, uh, they could get rid of you very quickly. The king always had, I mentioned I, I, uh, sports is a part of my life, so I, I, sorry if I use sports lingo, but that's part of my life. The king always had a bunch of, uh, of uh, potential queens out in the bullpen. He always had somebody getting ready for, he, he, warming up, so that if this wife didn't measure up and she didn't perform the way she was supposed to, he could select somebody else. And so Queen Esther was a beautiful young woman, and, and so when Xerxes got upset with his wife and it was time to find a new wife, uh, Esther was the one who was chosen. So Esther was this Jewish woman who was married to this very non-Jewish king named Xerxes. And Xerxes, his right-hand man it was the secretary of state, his prime minister, his vice president, his vice king, whatever you want to call it, had a guy named Haman. 
And Haman did not like the Jews. Long before Hitler tried to destroy the Jewish people, a guy named Haman, uh, around the year 500 B.C., wanted to destroy the Jewish people. He got irritated because the Jews would only bow down and worship God. And, and Xerxes considered himself a deity, and that he was God. And so when, when Xerxes would come through the streets, all the, the Persians would bow down and, and worship their, their king, and the Jews wouldn't. It's why guys like Daniel get thrown into the lion's den and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get thrown into the fiery furnace because they refuse to bow down uh, to this man who is not God. So Haman wants to get rid of the Jews, and he has a plan to do it. He's built these gallows uh, in which he's going to hang uh, some of these Jews and get rid of the rest of them. Well, Esther finds out about this, and so Esther goes before the king. Her, her, uh, her cousin or her uncle named Mordecai learns about the plan. He goes to his, his niece and says, Esther, uh, you need to talk to the king uh, because otherwise our people are going to get wiped out. And in that day, it was the understanding that nobody could go into the king's presence without the king inviting them in. In other words, you can't just go to the front door of the king and say, I'd like to see the king. Um, and the only way that you could be, otherwise you'd be put to death. And the only way, if you came into that uh, place, area of the king, was if he extended his scepter to say, you can come on in. Esther could have been put to death by walking in uninvited to see her husband. Trust me, she was not the only toy that he had. And so she, she could be put to death. And if she was gone, he could pick somebody else. It was not a big deal to him. So, so Esther goes in, and she gets up the nerve. She's going to tell her husband, the king, about what's going on. And so she does, and the king extends the scepter. She comes in. He tells the king what happens, and the king then has Haman hung on those gallows, and so the, the Jewish people are spared. But that's the story of the book of Esther. And then as we go on, uh, you've got uh, Job, Psalms. The book of Job is about suffering, and it's about God's presence in the midst of it. If you think you're having a bad day, read the book of Job. Job was a wealthy man. And I don't want to give you the impression, you know, some people, there's, there's this thing called prosperity gospel that's out there. And prosperity, it, it's kind of like some of the people that you might have, now I'm not saying every TV preacher is a bad person. There are some really good preachers that are on TV. Uh, there really are. But there are some that are called what we call prosperity uh, preachers. And a prosperity uh, preacher would say to you, they would say, listen, uh, uh, Brent, if you um, if you give a uh, uh, hundred dollars to our to our uh, campaign, uh, you're going to get two hundred dollars back. That's the way God functions. You know, you can't out give God, and so He's going to take good care of you. And the prosperity preacher gives the impression that if you're a faithful God follower, that everything is going to go well for you. You're going to have the multi-million dollar house and the seven-figure income and the four-car garage and the seventy-five thousand or hundred thousand dollar vehicle in each each garage stall, and everything is going to go great for you. You'll join the, the life of the rich and famous. That's prosperity preaching, and it's false preaching. It's not what the Bible teaches. Um, and, and so uh, Job, though, was a wealthy man. Not wealthy because God owed it to him. He was, God blessed him. And one day Job uh, had um, all ten of his children died in a horrible accident. In one day, all ten of his children died. Um, his wealth was taken, his wealth was destroyed, and his home was destroyed in one day. That's a bad day. And then if that wasn't enough, then a few days later, he was attacked by this horrible skin disease, and he was absolutely miserable, so much so that he would go out and sit by the town dump and just grieve and mourn, and he would take pieces of pottery and scrape the sores and the scabs from his body, and the dogs would come and lick him, it says. And his wife finally came to him and said, Job, listen, why don't you just curse God and die? Because how could life get any worse? And Job's response, well, the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. But Job was still, I think, in shock. And he was numb. And he didn't realize all that had hit him. And then Job began, and then he has three friends who come to him. And his friends who come to him, at first they just come just to listen. They don't come to give him advice. They just come to sit with him, just just to be with them. Sometimes I think we're, we don't know what to say. We go to the funeral home or somebody's gone through something hard and we don't know what to say. You know what? Sometimes don't say anything. Just give them a hug and say, I love you. 
You don't have to have any fancy words. Sometimes people say, well, when I go through hard times, now I know who my real real friends are because some of these people don't even come and see me. It doesn't mean they don't come and see you because they don't care about you. They may just not know what to do. They just feel so helpless. They 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 want your hurt to go away. They don't understand that it's a process of grieving. So they stay away and they don't say anything. It doesn't mean that they don't love you. They, just, they don't know what to do. And so Job's friends just came and they just sat with him. The problem developed when they began to say, Job, man, this isn't getting any better. What, what, what have you done to, to make God mad at you? See, first of all, God's not the cause of those kind of things. I've, I've oftentimes said, and this is what we'll talk about in about three weeks, God oftentimes gets blamed for things for which he has no responsibility whatsoever. You know, somebody dies of a horrible disease, we get mad at God. God didn't bring disease into the world. Uh, Something happens, you know, the house burns down, we get mad at God. But God didn't, that's not God. And we'll, we'll talk about that in about three weeks, about where does all that come from. So, um, so Job gets to the, and so his friends start questioning and then Job then begins to get mad at God in his grief. And he says, God, it's not fair. How come? And everything else. And, and God said, listen, Job, I- I'm with you. I got you. And in the end, and in the end, Job found physical healing. In the end, uh, Job had more children. In the end, his wealth was restored. It doesn't always end that way. Sometimes it ends with passing away and going to heaven, where now there's no more pain and no more suffering and all is good. But Job is about the faithfulness of God and the provision in the midst of all of that. Psalms, Psalms was the song book, the hymn book of the people of God. A lot of poetry in the book of Psalms. Um, Many of the hymns and many of the songs that we sing are based upon the book of Psalms. Some taken right out of the book of Psalms. Uh, Some very powerful words in the book of Psalms. What's interesting is in a lot of churches... You know, we went through this 25, 28 years ago, and a lot of churches have gone through what I call the worship wars. When I was a kid growing up in church, you know, we had the Lutheran hymnal, and we had these different liturgies in the Lutheran hymnal, and if we had, uh, if it was a communion service, it was on page 15, and if it was a non-communion service, we'd open up to page 5, and the service was pretty much, and there's nothing wrong with, they're beautiful liturgies, there's nothing wrong with them, Um, and, but it was pretty much, that's what we did. And we sang with the organ, and and that was great. And then all of a sudden, new forms of of worship began to be introduced into the church. And so at St. Peter's, if you come to one of our four services, you'll find our Thursday night and our Sunday at 8 o'clock service, some more traditional with pipe organ and hymns and, and, and liturgies and those things. If you come to our Saturday night or our 1045 service on Sunday, you'll find synthesizers and drums and electric guitars and and, and um, bass guitars and those kind of things. And, 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 and in some churches, that creates a war. I remember when we first started doing that here. I mean, we had 80, 85% of our people, we had a vote. Do you want to offer a different style of worship? 85% of the people said yes. But you still had that very small portion of the 15% who really wanted to stir the pot. That's not what it means to be a Lutheran. That's If you want to go to the Holy Roller Church, go to the Holy Roller Church. Luther was one of the most radical contemporary guys in the church. In Luther's day, the congregation didn't sing. Luther introduced singing to the congregation. And he would take common tunes that people knew when they'd go to the tavern that they could sing, and he'd put biblical words to common tunes that people enjoyed singing. That was pretty contemporary, if you ask me. So to be a Lutheran doesn't mean that we have to sing 500-year-old hymns, though there are some wonderful 500-year-old hymns that I love to sing. But it has not, that has nothing to do with being a Lutheran or not. I tell people when it comes to worship and music that, listen, everything that we do worship-wise is directed to one person, and that's God. He's the audience. We are a group of 20, 40, 80, 100, 500, 1,000, 1,300 people who are singing for an audience of one, and that's God. So if I don't like that song or you don't like that song, it's not intended for you. It's intended for the God of the universe. And different people connect with God in different ways. Some people love to sing hymns, and I love to sing hymns, and some love to sing more contemporary songs, and I love to sing contemporary songs. So I go to all four services. Well, I have to, right? But 
we, we, don't need to, we don't need to get into those worship wars. And then you've got Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, those were all written by Solomon. If you want to write Solomon to the left there, they were all written by King Solomon, the son of King David, this wise man who sometimes was foolish. So uh, Proverbs is a bunch of uh, a collective small sayings about life. Um, uh, and then you've got uh, Song of Solomon, uh, which is... Uh, a song, um, which is really a love song that Solomon wrote to his bride. And, and in the Bible, the church is called the Bride of Christ. And we have a God who loves us, and we'll unpack that more later. And then uh, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes is, uh, Ecclesiastes, my take on Ecclesiastes is, it's, it's Solomon's uh, journal about a midlife crisis that he went through. A midlife crisis. Solomon had all this wealth, because remember, Dad handed him off a kingdom that was at peace, so he had all this money to burn, but he couldn't find contentment in life. And so he would build a bigger mansion. And he loved that for a while, but that got boring. And so he needed to build a bigger mansion, and that got boring. And, and then he would bring in musicians. You know, he would, in his day, he would bring in, you know, the people today. I don't know. who I, I, I guess I'm just old-fashioned, you know. I, I guess, I don't know who are the pop. I don't even know. I go watch the Grammys. I don't even know who these people are anymore. But, you know, maybe when, uh, when Beyonce was at her peak, you know, bringing in a Beyonce. Or when Elvis was at his peak, they bring in Elvis. Or when... You know, Frank Sinatra in the 40s or 50s was in his peak. They'd bring in, for, he would bring in the big dogs. And he enjoyed that. You know, you can go to a concert. Debbie and I, a couple weeks ago, went up to Symphony on the Prairie and the Temptations were there. And, and I love Motown music and we grew up, and I was born in the late 50s and so I was a teenager in the 70s. So I love Motown music and it was a lot of fun. But, and, and we enjoyed it. But the next day it was back to the real world. You know, dealing with all kinds of things in life that you deal with. So the book of Ecclesiastes was Solomon's journey trying to find meaning and contentment and satisfaction in life. And in the end of the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, ultimately life is about recognizing that everything that I have in life that is good is from God and enjoying the gifts that he gives to me and living my life in a way that's pleasing to him. Kind of simple. But he went through this long journey to try to figure all that out. So uh, next, so we are going to much more rapidly go through uh, the next uh, two sections of the Old Testament, uh, and we'll go through the books of the New Testament. So next week we will wrap up uh, lesson number one. Okay, next week we will. I told you it'd take us two or three weeks to do that, and uh, I know where I'm going. We're good. We're okay. Uh, by the end, we'll we'll have covered everything by the time we get to the end. Uh, so next time, we'll go through those next two sections, the major prophets, the minor prophets. We'll go through the books in the New Testament. Uh, not nearly as much history to cover in the New Testament. And then we'll take a look at the Bible verses tied into that as well. So um, any qu- I was been machine gunning you to death here. Any, any questions you have in light of that? I didn't hardly take a breath to even invite you to say anything, and I, that wasn't intentional. But are there any questions? So let's do this. Uh, if you will, if you haven't yet, put your name on that white sheet. Um, if you were here last week, I don't need all the other information. Just your name on the white sheet. And then um, if somebody uh, from each table can just put those white sheets on uh, that round table back in the corner. If somebody can grab whatever pens or pencils and put those in that basket that I don't know, what is it? One of those longa barger or whatever. Is that how you pronounce that? Uh, basket back there. Um, and... Uh, and I think that should take, what is it? Did I get that right? I don't know. I don't, I'm not into that kind of stuff. Um, and so uh, I think then we should be good on that. And if you were not with us last week and you'd like the uh, jump drive from last week's session, um, you can grab those. There are, it looks like a number of them in that plastic thing. If possible, when you're done with them, if you could return them uh, because... Uh, we can recycle them. Those are like $3 a piece. We used to do these on DVDs, and you get a DVD for like $0.10 cents a piece, uh, but jump drives are a whole lot more expensive. 
So if you use them, take them, use them as long as you need. If you have somebody else you want to give it to who will use it, give it to them. That's okay. That's worth the $3. But if you're done with them and you don't have anybody else to give it to, if you'll just return those and then we can recycle them and keep on using them. Okay? So let me close with a word of prayer. I'm glad you're here. I hope this room works and we'll do the best we can. So let's pray. Father, uh, thank you for uh, more space to, uh, for us tonight. And I thank you for more people who are here tonight. Lord, I thank you for all who are, who are in attendance. And, uh, and I, I pray also for those, Lord, who couldn't be with us tonight uh, as they return. Lord, as we continue this study, uh, I just pray that you would remind each of us um, that you love us beyond measure, uh, that you, who are the God of the, the universe, uh, that you know us by name, you know the number of hairs upon our head, you know everything we're dealing with, and that you want the very best for us. So may we continue, Lord, to have an appetite to get to know you better, and may our relationship with you grow even stronger. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks for coming.